And I'm going to paste a link here. Um, so Paul, I see you're already listed as a panelist. If you want to go ahead and um, share your screen, then um, we will get started um, with Paul Downhauer as our first speaker. So Paul is a professor of chemical engineering. If you're on Twitter, you know he's uh, probably the most prolific tweeter in the catalysis community, and also is uh, an entrepreneur and innovator in catalysis and today he's going to tell us about uh, the, the newest thing that that he's been working on which is an idea of, of dynamic catalysis catalytic resonance uh, and a really exciting way to get past a lot of steady state limitations in catalysis so with that paul i'm going to hand it to you and um, uh, one more thing for the audience what we'll do is have um, questions in the Q&A and we will moderate those and we'll feed those to the to the speaker when your time uh, for answering questions is. All right, so how about um, Paul, take it away. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me okay? John, yeah. can you hear me? Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks to the organizers and everything and people for calling in. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about this new concept that we've been working on, uh, which we're calling catalytic resonance theory. And this connects to a lot of the problems that we were aware of uh, in looking for new ways to use catalysis to solve some of these sustainability challenges. And I'll give you one of them as an example. There's this issue that we have now low cost wind and solar power, but we have it in places where we don't live. And uh, for example, one way we could think about utilizing this is to put massive solar arrays in the middle of Australia, where there's a lot of uh, dirt, sand, and scorpions and snakes, uh, and then be able to convert that into hydrogen which we could then convert into ammonia, put into tankers and move around the country uh, to places like India or China, or Japan that have very high energy density. Of course, the challenge there is uh, implementing all of this in terms of renewable energy technology, but also the catalytic conversion of water to hydrogen and then hydrogen to ammonia. And these are classic problems in catalysis. And if you think about these things conceptually, they all have a sequence of events that have to happen. The first step being absorption, the second overall step is surface reaction, and the third step being desorption. And it's been known for a long time that these types of systems and, and a lot of catalytic chemistries exhibit these Sabatier volcanoes that you see on the right, where the turnover frequency of the reaction is a function of some descriptor of the reaction. In this case, I'm showing it as a relative binding energy of B star, the surface product, where as I go stronger in binding, the desorption rate becomes limiting and the rate goes down. As I go weaker in binding, I, I become reaction controlled by the surface reaction. And when I actually balance this out, I reach this optimum for a static material. And uh, beating that maximum has been the challenge. Now, if I think about uh, how we can overcome this problem, I, I could think about how I could try to balance out all the steps to get the best possible scenario. But I'm always essentially cheating one step to benefit the other. And so this has been the kind of the premise of modern catalysis, we, a search for materials. We have this belief that we can take a, a reaction like we see on the right, where the uncatalyzed system is a very high barrier, and think about finding a material that drops us down to some catalyzed mechanism where the transition state lower energy is lo lower to go from A star to B star. Of course, the problem then is your, your desorption energy is uh, so high that we have to balance that with the energy associated with the surface reaction. And so what we're looking for is a way to both reduce the binding energy, but also at the very exact same time, reduce the transition state energy. And so I, I say this here is broken in blue because what we've done is um, we might have the same surface thermodynamics, but the transition state energy is lower. So we've changed the scaling relation between that. And of course the question is, will we find a new material, be it a nanoparticle or a MOF or a zeolite or a single atom that can give you a different scaling relation that tries to make the catalyst energy pathway as flat as possible to get from A to B. And that's, that's the question. Will we find that kind of magic material that's able to break all of these or appeal to every single individual elementary step? And so what I wanna propose is an alternative. Rather than trying to find one material that can meet all of the demands of all the steps at the same time, Let's take a dynamic material and make it such that it changes with time such that when each event in the elementary sequence happens, that catalyst changes for that particular elementary step. So let me start with a very simple case here, this A to B reaction. In the first case, state one, it's favorable to go from A to A star through the transition state to B star. And then when we oscillate to state two, now it's more favorable for desorption. 
And so when we think about flipping between these two states, we could think of it as favorable for each of the two great limitations of surface reaction and desorption. And when we do that, if we come back to this idea of Sabatier optimum, we're thinking about this now as two sides of the volcano, but in this case, we take each of the elementary steps and we extend them up above the Sabatier optimum. And if we do this flipping of states at the right frequency, we'll eventually overcome that optimum and try to achieve this tie line between the two dashed lines you see up there on the very top. Now, the question is, how do we do this experimentally? How does this behave in terms of a real system? How does it behave in terms of a theoretical system? All of these things are big picture questions that we'd like to tackle. And so to do this, we put together a team of people working on this all together. This is all funded through the Catalysis Center for Energy Innovation, uh, U.S. Department of Energy program. And you can see my picture there is on the left. But we are combining together all sorts of concepts of theory, um, computation, experimental synthesis, and experimental reaction dynamics to try to understand these particular systems. Now, I'm going to talk all about the, the theory behind this, but uh, two talks after me is going to be a talk by Professor Omar Abdelrahman, where he's actually going to show you an experimental system where he's been able to implement some of these ideas and show proof of concept. So his talk's at 12.30 Eastern time today. And you'll, he'll, he's going to actually show you this figure right here, which looks like the conceptual figure I showed you a few minutes ago, where you can actually see the, the static conditions here, the electrostatic conditions, give you this optimum. But the dynamic conditions at 100 hertz go over an order of magnitude faster than what you could achieve under static conditions. You'll have to see his talk to kind of get all the details on that particular uh, system, but I want to give it as a teaser here. And to let you kind of think about, in my talk, what are the conceptual issues that show up? And we'll get to how we implement this later. So let's explore this uh, computationally. Let's take a theoretical system. We'll stick just for the time being. It's complicated enough to think about a, a conceptual reaction of A goes to B. It will include all the elementary steps in between. And these could be equilibrated. They could not be equilibrated. Uh, we, we allow for all of these possibilities. And you think about just the parameters we now have. We have the normal reactor parameters of space, velocity, temperature, and pressure. We have all the parameters that show up in the catalytic chemistry, such as the thermodynamics, heat of absorption, transition state energy. But now we've doubled the number of parameters because we have to account for the dynamics. The amplitude of the dynamics, the position of that amplitude oscillation, the frequency that we do that, and of course, the waveform type and shape that, that the oscillation takes. So let's take a, a simple scenario here. So I'm taking now a, a system that flips an energy from strong to weak binding of the surface uh, species B star. And you can see it up on the top left. It goes from strong binding to weak binding with an oscillation of 0.6 electron volts. And what you see is as you flip from strong to weak binding, the product B, the instantaneous turnover frequency there in the middle, shoots up very quickly and then comes back down as you deplete the surface. You can even see that on the bottom set of data there where I'm flipping the surface coverage between species A and species B. So essentially we're, we're oscillating between a surface covered in A and a surface covered in B. And every time we flip, we push some amount of material off that surface. And the instantaneous uh, reaction rate goes up very high. Now, when you average that you know, reaction rate out, you'll get something that's uh, significantly higher than you could get under static conditions. And you, what you can think about then, well, how fast should I flip between the states? And so the data you're seeing here on the left is this instantaneous turnover frequency to the product B. What is, well, how is that being formed with time? And I'm showing this now for four different frequencies. The, the simulation starts out at one fixed static condition. And then you can see where all the colors emerge in the data. Those are four different frequencies. So at very low um, frequencies, 0 0.001 hertz, the system actually just rapidly uh, comes to a steady state that's very similar to a static system. It's actually quite slow. As you increase to 0.25 hertz now, the dynamic system matches the static optimum. And actually, as you go above that, 10 hertz, you're almost an order of magnitude above. And at 1,000 hertz, you can see several things that are interesting. It takes many oscillations to come to a new dynamic steady state, but also that the oscillation here uh, reduces as well. Now, if you put all this together, if I take each of those different frequencies and say, what's the average turnover frequency, and plot that as a function of the applied surface frequency, I can now look at this in terms of the plot you see here on the right, where the bottom is the applied frequency to the surface, and the vertical axis is that average reaction rate. And what you see is that my static optimum there in red is about <clears throat> 0.25 to 0.3 uh, turnovers per second. And as I increase the, react the applied frequency, I eventually get to this linear region where I increase in rate, 
and stop at about uh, 30 turnovers per second. And this is this resonance frequency where I've actually matched the applied dynamics to the natural dynamics of the reaction. And that goes all the way up to about a megahertz, at which point I can no longer fill the surface fast enough and the rate drops down. And I lose the benefit of matching the applied dynamics of the natural dynamics of the reaction. Now, of course, that's just for a given uh, amplitude, right? I've been using 0.6 electron volts, and it's for a, a specific range of, of application. But I can think about fixing the, the where I apply the amplitude, but, but also then change the width of it and the frequency at the same time and look at the uh, turnover frequency. So the, the plot you're seeing here on the left, everything I've been showing up to now has been, if you look at the x-axis on the bottom there, has been at 0.6 electron volts. So if you go up that vertically, starting from the very bottom, uh, and then go vertically up, you can actually see where that resonance band exists. And you can see you get up to around uh, 10 turnovers per second, but uh, <clears throat> around a, a thousand to a, me a million uh, hertz. And what you see though, is that as I make small increases from 0.6 to 0.7 to 0.8 electron volts uh, in uh, amplitude, the rate goes up significantly to the point where if you were able to achieve something as large, which is quite large, as a one electron volt dynamics for this particular system, you would, uh, in theory, get a thousand turnovers per second, which is something like uh, you know, enzyme levels. And you'd, you'd be at the, the range where you couldn't actually achieve these turnover frequencies because you hit a new diffusion limitation. Okay, so what, what can change in these systems? You think about that's kind of a, a computational exploration of one particular system. But we think of all the possible chemistries that are out there, we have to think about how the chemistries actually differ. And one way they're going to differ is in their reaction scaling uh, parameters. And you can see here, if I think about this BEP relationship with two surface species, A star and B star, we can think of them as a change in energy. Their transition state's also going to change. In this case, we're describing it by this linear relationship with parameters alpha and beta. And so if you go back uh, to the volcano plots that we talked about earlier, you can actually see on the left there are these volcano plots as we change this alpha scaling parameter. And at a high alpha, we have this steep slope with a very uh, tight volcano. And as we make that smaller and smaller, it becomes flatter and flatter. Now, of course, this matters for the dynamics that you apply. We think about the amplitude of how we're moving from the left side to the right side of the volcano. Of course, the volcano shape itself matters for what rates we can achieve. Now, if I go forward here, this is a steep volcano. This is an alpha of one. And what I've plotted here now is the turnover frequency on the vertical axis on the left panel. And as a function of the relative binding energy of B, just like we've been talking about. And if you think about applying different amplitudes, what you're doing in the purple points, the tie lines above the volcano peak, is connecting two different in independent elementary steps, uh, depending on, and the height of which depends on the applied amplitude. We can see now why small changes in the amplitude give you huge benefits in rate. And if all of these systems, if you look around the right panel now, you can see actually give you resonance frequency band, uh, but those benefits differ, you can see in the bar plot inset, in terms of the average turnover frequency you get. So for a, an al a high alpha and a high amplitude, you would theoretically achieve impossible turnover frequencies over 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, which could never be achieved. So this is essentially an extreme case. Now, other chemistries, if we go from an alpha of one, now I'm gonna show you a system with an alpha of 0.4. Now what we've done is taken the volcano and broadened it out such that amplitudes that previously were getting, being able to achieve higher rates above the volcano can no longer push as far up because the tie line between them has to extend further out. And you can actually see that on the right side. Now we still get this resonance band of frequencies but now the bar plot only extends up to 100 to 1,000 turnovers per second at these extremely high uh, amplitudes of over one electron volt, which of course is, is quite extreme in itself. But even in the low end or lower end of half an electron volt, which is very achievable experimentally, we're still getting reaction rates here on the order of 100 turnovers per second, which is incredibly high. Now, what else can we change? Well, so we can change the amplitude, uh, the chemistry itself will change, but we can also think about the dynamics that we're applying. So rather than a square wave, I can think about other waveforms of the surface I can apply. In this case, if you look at panel A, I'm applying a sinusoidal wave where I'm going between strong and weak binding. This is the exact same amplitude and system I was talking about earlier, and now we've only changed the shape. And what you see is if you look at the, at the 
on panel B, you still see this as we flip from strong to weak binding, we see this spike in the turnover frequency as we empty the surface. The shape is a little bit different, but so is the shape of the surface coverage in panel C, where you see I'm going between a mostly filled surface of A to a mostly filled surface of B, but it doesn't completely fill or unfill in this particular case. And so the question is, what's the difference in effectiveness of these different waveform shapes keeping all the parameters the same? And so if I go to the next set of data, you can actually see this right here. I'm comparing square waves to sinusoidal waves to trigonal and sawtooth. And what you see is that in every condition, basically the square wave is as good or better than every single uh, performance of every other uh, waveform we look at. And this makes conceptual sense. If we're trying to make the reaction surface chase the, the preferred state, trying to achieve a new steady state every time we switch, we would like to always spend time at the extremes to make it chase between filling and unfilling surfaces with favorable and unfavorable transition states. And any time we spend in between these two oscillation states, really that we're not driving the reaction in any favorable direction. That's why the square wave, which is always instantaneously flipping between favorable states is gonna be the most effective by a little bit. Now, what else matters? Of course, the, the scaling relations for the transition state are important, but we can also think about how things move on a surface. So trying to characterize all possible systems and thinking of this big picture, we have to think about all the possible scenarios. And luckily, there aren't that many new parameters we have to worry about. We still have the overall heat of reaction, delta H of reaction. We have the parameters for the transition state there in the middle I was talking about, so the activation energy is a function of alpha and beta. But now we have to think about how the two intermediates, A star and B star, are also changing relative to one another. And so we need two new parameters, in this case, to think about how these are related. People have, have proposed these parameters before for other systems, so it's not entirely new. If I think about this, I, I want to think about how A star and B star are changing relative to each other by some amount. That's the, the slope. And then I need some fixed point in energy that I can relate between the two. And the point that seems uh, most obvious is this point we call delta. You can actually see it in purple there on the left side. It's the point in energy where both A star and B star, star have the exact same value in energy. And that's important. I'll, I'll get to this later in the talk about why that point is actually special. But between those two now, I can put this plot up where I show the heat of absorption of A versus the heat of absorption of B. And I can think of these things. In this case, I'm going to plot them. Assume they're all linear in this case. They don't have to be linear. But, but in this case, that's how we're going to describe it as a first pass. So here, here you can see the heat of reaction of A and heat of reaction of B. And they have this delta point of common energy. But then any possible accessible heat, uh, heat of absorption or binding energy changes along this line. In this case, my gamma, my slope, is greater than one. So <clears throat> uh, one of the species changes more than the other. In this case, it's B. Uh, of course, that could be smaller. You could have different uh, delta points. These things all depend on the surface, but also the, the adsorbate, but also the stimulating method you use to change the binding energy itself. So what are those methods, and how do they really change? We can start thinking about this just by looking at something like periodic metals. In this case, I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually thinking about how different metals interact. So this has been known for a long time. This is data taken from Avrakakis and coworkers, where they looked at the different uh, ammonia intermediate species adsorbed on different surfaces. And what you see here is that the heat of adsorption of NH star versus NH2 star is linear across these different metals. And you can see there the gamma is 0.5, that's the slope. And on the right side, you can actually see NH star versus NH3 star uh, has a much lower slope of 0.2. Now, of course, if I'm doing this dynamically, what I would like to do in this case is have, have something like uh, ruthenium in and then quick switch that to gold. And if I could magically turn one element into another, that would be desirable. But of course, we haven't invented that technology yet, and we're not going to. Uh, so we need to think about other stimulating methods by which we could make a binding energy change with time. And a lot of other people have looked at this before us. This is work on the left side here from uh, Jean Sabine McEwen. Uh, where he looked at the adsorption energy under different electric fields, where in this case, I'm showing the adsorption energy uh, from aldehyde, hydrogen, and methane as a function of the methanol uh, binding energy. And you can see again here, these have different slopes, but also they can have negative slopes. So in this case, methanol versus formaldehyde move in opposite directions. Another way to think about this is something like surface strain. If I change the surface strain, I'm changing the binding energy and you can see here that all the different uh, species show up in, uh, or different metals show up in different places, but they also have different slopes. And of course, to achieve these large binding energy shifts with strain is difficult, uh, 
uh, to actually implement because you'd need incredibly large, likely infeasible levels of strain. So what else is out there that we could use to tune the binding energy? Uh, there's, of course, electrocatalysis, where the, we know that the charge counter layer forms is double layer in the liquid with a local electric field, which we know electric fields can tune the binding energy. But we also have this variation of the surface potential. For something like a Faradaic reaction with an electron energy, that can change quite dramatically. And I recommend you stay on if you're interested in that to see Omar Abdel Rahman's talk. He's going to talk specifically about that type of system. But there are many other types of systems out there. I'll show you one more on the right side here is field effect modulation, <clears throat> uh, which is essentially a field effect transistor. And if you're, if you're not familiar with these devices, you can actually just think of them as capacitors. In this case, I have a dielectric layer there in the middle. And the gate is just a metal that's inert. So it might be something like gold where we apply a voltage. Now, when you do that, you induce a charge in the top catalyst layer. So you can actually accumulate electron density or, <clears throat> or deplete it. And so what we're doing there is moving the D-band center of the metal with time. And that can actually happen very quickly. And uh, it's already been shown that this can be done by my colleague Dan Frisby for the HER reaction to produce hydrogen. You can do this to make things like molybdenum sulfide behave more like platinum. It's a very cool technology and there's a lot to do. And it can be done in the gas phase. So. Okay, so all of these different techniques, plus other ones I'm not showing you, they all are gonna give you different scaling relations. And so we have to think about, well, which scaling type relation types do I want? Are there preferable different types of slopes and gammas and deltas that I would prefer? And so let's go back to this system here and just look at it. And what you can see is that, again, this is the same system I was looking at earlier, where I'm showing you the turnover frequency to be at different temperatures. But the more important thing is over on the right side, where I'm plotting the surface coverage and you can, as a function of the binding energy of B. And of course, at high surface uh, coverage of B, we're at strong binding. And as I weaken the binding energy, I then cross over to have a strong, uh, uh, a high level of surface coverage of A. And as I keep going from right to left, I get weaker and weaker binding to the point where the surface is just open. That's temperature dependent, of course. So I'm crossing over there between surface coverages as I do the oscillation and binding energy. And I can actually think about this now in terms of different stimulating systems that will give me different scaling relations. So now the color scheme you're looking at here, this is gamma parameter up on the top. And you can see a gamma of one means in black, means that the two surface species move together at the same energy. They might be offset, but they'll move together. Now, <clears throat> the systems in blue are the gamma, the high gamma systems, and those are the pictures I'm showing you. The systems in red are the low gamma systems. And so I can look at the surface coverage now on the left side of A and the surface coverage of B on the right side. And you can see that as I change this gamma parameter, I'm actually shifting how steep this transition is in surface coverage. And so you can imagine if I want to use, if I want to flip the surface coverage effectively, I would like as high a gamma as possible. And so I can tell you just from looking at this diagram alone that if you want a very high gamma system, you can get it. You basically want to stay away from a gamma one where species move together because you'd like to manipulate their behavior relative to each other. And there's equivalent plots here for, for um, the red species, the low gamma. Again, you want to stay away from one. So if I put all these together now into a single plot, I can go back to this volcano plot and actually look at the turnover frequency to B as a function of this scaling parameter, the gamma that I'm looking at. And if you see what it's doing is it's sweeping out a range of reaction rates as I switch from a low to a high gamma, crossing over with one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip to the next slide where I show all of these possible volcano curves all together. So if I superimpose all of them together, the superposition of all, super, of all volcanoes gives me a supervolcano. And you can actually see that it sweeps out this space on the right side, which is related to the desorption rate maximum, and the left side, which is related to the adsorption rate. And you can see basically then that every variation from the supervolcano results from a reaction rate limitation. So a perfect system would have no surface rate limitation, and it would be right at the binding energy there, where basically the reaction on the surface happens instantaneously. And you can actually see the gamma of one right there in the middle has this flat region where I'm not able to increase the rate at all. Now, of course, different stimuli give us different types of gamma systems, so the question becomes how do these behave? And that's something we want to keep exploring and, and studying and understanding the relation between materials, adsorbates, and stimulating methods like light, potential, and strain. Now, what else can we do with these particular systems? Like, we've been talking about rate, but we know that a lot of reacting systems, like the ones you see here, like ammonia synthesis, um, methanation, water gas shift, 
uh, all have this problem of equilibrium conversion. So in this case, I'm, I, ammonia is favorable of reaction in red at low temperature thermodynamically, but it's kinetically accessible at high temperatures where the reaction is not thermodynamically favorable. And there are similar situations for many, many other reactions. And so the question becomes, how do we manipulate these particular systems? Right now, we think we have a reaction that's not thermodynamically favorable. We can pressurize it to make push the reaction one way or another, or we can change the temperature, change the composition, all these kind of things. And that, what that's essentially doing is changing the overall equilibrium by changing the endpoint states. Of course, the other thing we could do is take our system under, this, under the favorable thermodynamics for a process and then add work to the system that manipulates the steady state uh, uh, reaction in terms of the, the reactor performance. So if we add work to the system, this is this delta delta G you see here in the Gibbs free energy plot as a function of conversion. We would like to add work to a system and shift the steady state away from equilibrium to some new steady state by applying dynamics to the surface. Now, how does this work? Let me show you a simulation first and I'll explain you how it works. In this case, I'm showing you a batch reactor system where I have A going to B. This is that same model system I've been working with. And I can start out the batch reactor at many different compositions. So it could be pure B, it could be pure A, it could be any composition of mixture of A and B in between. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let the batch reaction simulation proceed with time under this dynamic oscillation. In this case, my, my amplitude of oscillation is relatively small. It's only 0.2 electron volts. Um, and so when I do that, you can see that no matter what composition I start out at the left side, my batch reactor system under dynamic conditions goes to a steady state of about 70 mole percent of B, okay? And at some point in time, when I switch from dynamics to statics, the reaction goes right back to equilibrium, as it, as it better have or else we're some, uh, you know, problem with the simulation. So that's our check to show that we're not violating equilibrium, we're just imposing some new uh, element of work into the system. Now, the question is, well, how does this work? And this gets to an idea that's been around for, for a long time in many other systems, particularly biology. And that is that as we're oscillating the binding energy, we're creating an energetic ratchet, which can move species from one side to the other by actually lifting them and changing their binding energy with time. So we're applying work between the two different states of A and B. Uh, and of course, there's some efficiency to this because I'm getting some benefit out in terms of the apparent delta G relative to how much amplitude and work I'm putting into that particular system. Like I said, this shows up in biology. There's, there's molecular pumps that move things into and out of cells. There's uh, other walkering type uh, ratchet systems that move things along cells. This is uh, all over biology found these types of mechanisms long ago. But what we'd like to do is, is think about how we could use them in heterogeneous analysis. In this case, in this um, animation you see here, what's happening is in the strong bonding state, that's where the transition state energy is the lowest. And that's where the green will flip over and form the yellow. Now, as we go to the weak bonding state up at the top, yellow species are able to get up into the product gas phase. And where the inefficiency comes from is that as we drop back down, some of the product yellow species are able to fall backwards into the, the hole. And there's a competition between green going to yellow and yellow going from surface species up into the gas phase. And some of these systems can be, can be quite efficient and other conditions are completely inefficient. You can actually see that in their performance, depending on the parameters that you pick. Okay, so let's, let's look at one of these example systems here where I've got an amplitude now. Here's a volcano plot where I'm showing you again the binding energy of E star as a function of the average turnover frequency. And I'm gonna fix the amplitude that I'm actually imposing here, but I'm gonna slide the amplitude left to right and say, well, which of these conditions gives me a favorable performance in my conversion? And in this case, what you're seeing here is the steady state conversion of my particular batch reactor. And you can see green here is actual equilibrium. So if I'm at very low oscillation frequencies, I get no benefit in pushing the system away from equilibrium. But as I move the amplitude from left to right, you can see that I go from a state on the left where I push it to high, very high conversions, and a system on the right in blue where I'm going to very low conversions. And you can see there's a very fine dividing line there between those two forward and reverse lobes in terms of overall conversion. So what actually determines that and uh, there's a lot of other things to pull out here, but the obvious one is where we go from forward to reverse. And it turns out there's a very simple explanation for how we drive something forward or backwards. And it has to do with the energy of the filling state of your catalyst. If you look here in blue, there's a forward and a reverse scenario. And what's actually very clear is when you're strong binding, which side of the, the surface reaction is a lower energy. 
So in the reverse case here, my A star in yellow here is at lower energy. I fill that more. When I flip to the U max red state, I'm removing that favorably. I reverse the ratchet on the right side by making the B star, uh, the, the, the green state and the filling state in blue there, lower in energy. And so that's a relatively simple prediction here by knowing where this transition happens is where yellow and blue surface species have the same energy. That's the delta point. And so I can, I can actually find conditions where I can take reactions and move them forward or reverse and push them away from equilibrium by applying work of lifting them up. Now there's one other place that dynamics can have a big role, and that's when we go from a single elementary step reaction to, in this case, we can look at multiple reactions, but in this case, I'll just look at two parallel elementary reactions. In this case, A could go to B as a product, or A could go to C as a product. And what I think about is if I have a system that's, let's say, 80% selective for one of these species, that's pretty good. But really, when you think about this conceptually, an 80% selectivity of a reaction under kinetic control just means that the favorable reaction is only four times faster than the unfavorable reaction. So a four to one ratio. And so the question becomes, what happens when I take one of the reactions and I make it go 10 or 100 or 1,000 times faster? My selectivity, my kinetic selectivity here should go um, significantly higher in terms of overall performance. So we can start thinking about two different reactions in a particular system, and I'll show you one here in the bottom right in panel C, where I can think about how the two surface species change with time relative to A, and they have that crossover point there of delta BC. Now when I do this, I can look at the plot on the left. These are the turnover frequencies of the two reactions, and it's very clear that it's relatively easy under static conditions to make product C. So if that's what I want to do, then this problem is already solved. But if I want to make product B, it's a lot harder because you can see that there's no scenario where I can selectively make B and not make C at all. And so the question becomes, if I apply this dynamic approach, is there a way to accelerate the production of B over the production of C such that it's favorable? And that's the panel over on the right here where you can see I'm showing you the selectivity as color. So the selectivity of B here is red, there's that lobe of B that you see right there, the selectivity to C is blue, and the green is equilibrium here. So if we let this run for an infinite amount of time under static conditions, we would make equal amounts of A and B, which is the bottom right. And so while it's not normally possible to select for B, you can actually see that at low oscillation frequencies, that's gonna give you the same outcome of a system under static conditions. The only possible scenarios are all C in blue, or green, which is equal amounts of B and C. And what's possible, even at low frequencies, you can see here at about 0.1 hertz, we're even able to get into this red zone at about negative 0.1 electron volts of left amplitude. And you can actually see that as you get up into the 10 to 100 to 1,000 range, it's possible to become almost perfectly selective to product B. Okay, so how does this work? We can think about this in terms of the three different rates. There's the rate of conversion of A you see here on the left. And you can see that A is favorable in terms of overall reaction rate of the reactant under two different conditions. There's this lobe in the top left, and there's a lobe in the top right right there. Um, and then on the right, what we're showing now, these are calculations for just the reaction from A to B and just the reaction from A to C. And what you can see is that these two independent regions show up for the reactor, they show up in each of the products, which essentially means that if I pick the right oscillation conditions, I can resonate one reaction or the other and make that more favorably at higher rates. Now, how does this work in terms, why isn't this just a simple divider then between the two steps? Why do we have these complex uh, behaviors emerging just from a simple A to B and A to C uh, parallel reaction? And the answer has to do with the fact that there's two ways to think about this, and both of these show up in terms of competition. I'm showing you an energy diagram here from A to B and A to C. And you can think about the right side, where in that case, under the filling state, the strong binding, C star is lower, is, is low lower in energy than B star, and it'll dominate the surface. In which case, if you dominate the surface, you will potentially dominate the products that are made. Alternatively, on the left side, you can imagine that B star in the weak binding state, the blue line there, desorbs much faster. So if C star can't come off the surface, essentially it might dominate the surface, but it can never be formed as a product. And so the balance between those two gives you the complex behavior that you see in these selectivity plots. Okay, so where is this going? Of course, we, we have all this effort in experimental work, and Omar's gonna show you some of that in, in, in two talks, uh, but there's all sorts of complex behavior for which the fundamentals are not known. What happens when you have reactions in series? We already know, if you go A to B to C to D, that multiple waveforms here have the potential to allow you to accelerate these complex systems. 
But what about reactions in parallel, bio, biomolecular reactions, uh, complex mechanisms, or even bizarre dynamics where you have these negative gammas and many other possible systems? How are we going to possibly uh, explore and understand how to selectively make one species out of maybe a complex network of 10? These are all open challenges in this area of dynamics as, as it proceeds. And of course, we can think about, you know, what are the opportunities, which is really what I want to do. Can we accelerate reactions past the Sabatier maximum? I think we already know that that's possible using dynamics based on the work that, that Omar is going to show you. But can we push reactions past equilibrium? Biology has already shown this. Can we do this with heterogeneous catalysis? We'll, we'll find out. And of course, number three might be a big economic opportunity. Can we overwhelmingly control selectivity for systems where the selectivity has essentially been stuck for a long time at some uh, selectivity amount uh, that we have not been able to overcome with a static catalyst? Of course, there's so much to do here. There's immense effort still required, even just to understand complex reactive systems. How do the stimulating methods like light or potential or strain, how do they change with the chemistry and different materials? And then how do we get more complex waveforms that can take apart these complex reacting mechanisms? So I'm almost out of time here. So let me just thank you know, the two people that have done the computational work here. A lot of this was done by uh, postdoc Alex Arda, who's written uh, the papers you see over here on the right. And then uh, Manish Shetty joined us last summer, who's also been doing computational work with us on these types of problems. And I'll put in a plug for them. They're both faculty candidates. So if your department wants to get in on this new area, uh, you can you know, get in right away by hiring two of, the, two of the people working on this problem right now. But of course, I mean, thank also the Department of Energy who funds this work in our, in our whole catalysis center for energy innovation, where we get to work on these emerging problems as a team where we can combine computation, material synthesis, uh, and experimental work all together. And that's what it really takes to, to make these systems that are complex work. So let me end it there. And I know there's, there's four minutes left to stay on time where maybe we can take a question. All right, thanks. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so we have uh, 11 questions. Um, so I'll, I'll try to summarize a few of them and, uh, and read them to you. So, so the first line of questions is really what is the source of the molecular resonance? Um, is this like matching the RPM of an engine to frequency of a tires or or something like that, and, and have you accounted or thought about the energy that's dissipated in damping the imposed oscillations? Yeah, that, I, how do you think about this is, is the key question. And the, the way I think about it is this picture right here. Each of these elementary steps have their own natural speeds, and that's what you think of as these extending lines. And so the reason I drew this horizontally, this tie line in purple, because that's where I, can, I match those two time constants. Um, they can each change, but I always want to match them up because if I have one, if one that's slower than the other, then I'm, I'm going to have an overall performance that runs at the slowest step. So I think of, I think of every particular elementary step as having a natural frequency. And I want to pair those up so that they're all the same. I want to maximize that as much as possible. Now, the second part of the question had to do with efficiency. And of course, I talked about efficiency in terms of molecular efficiency, but there's other types of efficiencies that I think you brought up in terms of like... Uh, energy loss or, or some sort of damping uh, energy that's lost. Those things definitely exist and they'll depend on the stimulating method. Uh, it's something we're definitely looking at in terms of saying how efficient is this. And of course, there's going to be more cost in doing this. And so the question becomes, does it make more sense to, to run a reactor at higher rates or better selectivity and save on the separations? Or is it better to do it a conventional way and pay for the separations? These are all process trade-offs that we're going to have to evaluate as we invent new technologies and try to find where the opportunities are. All right, thanks. Um, the next questions are kind of along the lines of, is there a way to determine if there's an ideal wave function or, or an ideal waveform that you can apply to this and what the, whether the turnover frequency is bounded if you had the perfect one? Um, so, in an A to B system, it's, easy, it's relatively easy to say because the system is so simple, right? You're looking at it right here. For a given amplitude, there is an optimal um, uh, frequency, and that's the frequency. It's half the frequency you read off from this particular chart because there's two steps. For more complex systems, I, I don't know the answer uh, for that particular question. Uh, what, what was the second part of the question? Um, let's see. Is, is there... The first part was, is there an ideal waveform? And the second part is, is there a well-defined like upper end of what's possible here? 
Oh, there definitely is. So you look at this picture that you're seeing right here with the, with the simulator, the animation. You could imagine that these extend up further and further. And if you went to higher and higher amplitudes, you would push it out further. But at some point, these become completely unfeasible, right? If you went to incredibly strong binding energies, right, you might, if you have an oxide or an oxygen on a metal, you might just form an oxide. Or if you have nitrogen, you might form a nitride. Or on the, on the reverse case, it's so weak binding uh, that these systems become infeasible. So there's definitely an upper limit. Plus, I mean, even at those conditions, the amount of amplitude is just phenomenal. I mean, one electron volt of amplitude is enormous. Um, I think experimentally, we can get half an EV for, for sure, but can we get one electron volt? These are all things that we have to determine still. So. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. Um, I think for, in the interest of time and staying on schedule, we'll switch over to, uh, to Professor Ulysses. Um, I'm gonna copy all of these questions in